As far as um, you know, benefits of exercise and proper nutrition. When we talk about our job and also um, you know, uh, with stress, is that you know, muscles help us to grow and retain that protein. Um, bones store the calcium that allow you to become stronger, which allows you to kind of function better in this environment. In addition, you know, eating regularly um, provides the actual nutrients to your body. Now, switching gears, um, in addition to, you know, sort of our well-being, we need to make sure as, a, as an EMT provider in the field that we're taking proper body substance isolation. Um, this is going to protect us from all the bad stuff that we are potentially exposed to. One of the things I kind of want to make note of um, and, and remind you, you know, put a star next to this. One of the most, um, one of the best things that you can do um, as a provider um, in this field is washing your hands. You want to wash your hands before, you want to wash your hands after contact. Even if your gloves are worn, you want to wash your hands. Um, soap and water is preferred, um, and you just want to make sure that you're actively washing. Um, even if you think that you didn't really get dirty, it's always a good idea to do that just because you never know what you're going to pick up. As far as for protection, um, we have you know gloves, um, we have different options, vinyl, latex, or synthetic. Um, these are used to protect us from bodily fluids. Um, and these should be changed in between patient contact. Um, you're going to use a lot of gloves over your career in this field. In addition to that, it's a good idea to have proper eye protection. You just never know when something's going to splash up, squirt at you, maybe some vomiting, maybe squirting of the blood. I know I've already talked about that. Maybe you have a patient that spits for some reason. Um, with those particular glasses, you want to make sure um, if you're wearing goggles or glasses, maybe prescription, maybe not, you want to make sure that it kind of shields your eyes from the sides as well as from the front. As far as for protection from airborne type particles or diseases, um, maybe this patient has tuberculosis, maybe this patient has the flu, um, or maybe they're sp spitting up blood. Um, there are two different types of masks. Um, one of the type of masks is a surgical type mask. Um, this is just meant to kind of prevent, it's a barrier, it prevents the, the fluids and the blood and the, the particles from, from getting, um, you know, it stops it in place. But it doesn't necessarily, um, you know, filter it out. Um, something that would prevent, um, you know, stuff coming through that we're concerned about little small particles getting through would be a HEPA mask or an N95 respirator. As far as for protection, you know, we might suggest you to wear gowns. Um, this is going to protect you from bodily fluid, whether it be for a significant trauma or sort of childbirth. As far as for scene protection, um, Basically, we have various different types of um, protection that may be available in the system that you particularly work in. If you're in a first responder firefighter position, you might have turnout gear for a traffic accident or some sort of fire, um, gloves, helmet, eyewear, and footwear. Um, in the EMS world or the pre-hospital world, um, you may also have these items due to the fact that there are um, times where you might have to get into a, 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 a vehicle that's all crunched up um, to provide patient care and again you want to be protected from um, touching sharp objects um, potentially harming yourself as well as protecting your head last but not least you know um, scene protection also might include body body armor um, i know that in my time when i was working with austin ems we were all issued body armor and any time that we were on a suspicious call type um, we were instructed to put our body armor on um, this is to protect us um, in the event that there was an active shooter, there were guns involved, there was shooting going on, anything that could potentially um, harm us in that particular field. Now, not every other, not every EMS system uh, has that available to them. In Williamson County, they don't, um, and it really just kind of boils down to a cost measure, um, and it just depends on your system. I see eventually in the, you know, where EMS is sort of progressing, I, I do eventually see um, this eventually going uh, uh, the way where we are going to all be issued body armor um, because some of the active shooter type drills that we've seen is that 
patients had a poor outcome in that particular situation, if they were shot or they were, uh, there was some sort of trauma involved in those active shooter situations because there was a delay of medicine getting to them. And, and that has a lot to do with the scene wasn't safe, police had to secure it, it took several minutes, several hours, um, and as a result, patients bled out. Well, what we're finding is, is that um, we're not necessarily going to be 100% um, going to be able to secure a scene in such like an active shooter situation. Law enforcement, it's going to take them hours potentially to find the shooter. And by the time they find the shooter, what they've found is that most of the time that shooter commits suicide. And so we may be getting to a place in this pre-hospital EMS realm where we are going to be showing up to very unsafe situations. And I could see eventually systems um, providing body armor as a requirement. And that just all kind of depends on your particular system that you're at. As far as for scene protection, um, this is going to kind of end our lecture today. Um, and this is something that I'm going to talk more about in class. Um, but I will just state that there is um, definitely some important things that you need to do to to sort of cover and hide yourself from different, um, you know, different calls that you might go on. And one of the things I would totally emphasize here is that each of us have um, an intuition inside. It's a, it's a little voice inside that says something's not right. I want you never to forget that voice that's inside. And the reason being is, is because that little voice inside uh, means something and it's pretty smart. Um, I've found myself when I have felt that way about something and, you know, we've sort of retreated from a scene and we've gone back in the truck and, you know, called law enforcement, there was usually something that was going on. And then sometimes, you know, it, it turned out there wasn't anything going wrong. But what if I was wrong? You know, what if I didn't do anything based on that little voice that was kind of telling me, hey, something's going on, maybe you should go back. And so I want you guys to make note of that. Uh, if you're ever working with a partner in the future and they say, you know what, I'm not feeling comfortable with this, listen to them. They have some sort of inner voice that's inside them that's saying, hey, something's up. I'm not sure about this. Um, and so never discount that um, and be careful with that. Um, I'm going to talk more in class and I'm going to show you some real examples of ways that you can cover yourself and conceal yourself on different situations. And so, you know, this particular slide doesn't really do us good um, uh, you know, it doesn't really show um, how, you know, this is best done. And this is something I'm going to elaborate more in class. So again, I want to thank you again for allowing me to provide this lecture this way. Um, I do again apologize that it was have to, you know, fit it in this way. Um, but I'm hoping that um, you guys were able to get something out of this. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me, josh.mcdermott at templejc. Dot com. Uh, each of you should have written that down. You're also welcome to text me or call me. And I look forward to seeing you guys uh, in the next class.